Welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. This is episode 353 with Ben Joseph Stewart. Ben Joseph Stewart is a filmmaker, musician, and producer, and he's created numerous documentaries, including DMT Quest, and he's the host of the Gaia TV shows Psychedelica and Limitless. I met Ben earlier this year because we were driving through Tennessee on the way home from visiting my family, and some friends of ours were staying at his house, and we drove out of our way a little bit and stopped by to see our friends, and we got to meet Ben and his wife and his kids, and it was it was really cool because I recognized him after a, a while from some of his shows that I watched on Gaia. And since then, we, we've stayed in touch. We, we've had a few collaborative calls, and I really love what Ben is up to, and I wanted to have him on the show because he's so good at taking all kinds of esoteric knowledge and new scientific research and picking up the vibe of society and tying that all together in really uplifting messages. So we're going to talk about a variety of things today, including the magic of fascia, this organ in your body that's so important and we don't even realize that much about it. It's, um, it has light communication, fiber optic communication system. It affects everything from your posture and your gait and your breathing and all of these things are connected. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about his first film, uh, Esoteric Agenda and how it went viral. And this was before YouTube even existed. And that one project, which wasn't even what he thought it was going to be when he started it, has led to all the opportunities that have developed for him over the last eight or nine years. We're going to talk about conspiracy theories and psyops and the importance of achieving harmony, even with diversity, even with all these different opinions and ideas and beliefs. And he talks about specifically the power of stories and how people come to believe things and why it's so important for him, the work that he's doing being a filmmaker. And we're going to hear some really amazing stories, including one about a vision that Ben had about knowing that his wife was pregnant before talking to her. So without further ado, strap yourself in for an amazing show with Ben Joseph Stewart. How you feeling? Feeling good, man. It's the uh, past few, maybe like four or five days, I had this stomach bug going around the family. Uh, you know, and it's it's like mild and it only like I'll wake up thinking I'm a hundred percent and then I'll eat something and I'll just be like, mm, doesn't doesn't sit as well. I'm not as like into caffeine right now, which is great. But I had a worst part of it is I think I had a caffeine headache because I went a few days without it and I'm like caffeine i i don't even really need it <laughs> you know i just do it i just do it so yeah doing well though other than that good yeah you know i was uh it was really funny is i was watching your peter gabriel rendition and then i was whistling it when heidi came home and she was like i was just humming that same song uh because it was it was stuck in my head for the last day and i was like whoa it's crazy yeah for some reason i'll have a song just come to me in the middle of the night i'll wake up in the middle of the night and i'll have a song in my head that was one of them and then i i listened to the lyrics and i was like whoa he's talking about a mystical experience like i've known this song forever but i never listened to the lyrics and actually like caught what he was talking about and then yeah. so when I when I first listened to it, you know, after I had it in my head, I was like, oh, my God, like I, I feel exactly where he's coming from. He had a mystical experience. He didn't think his friends would understand. So he kept it to himself. And then he, he just started like realizing like, oh, I just got to be me. <laughs> so that's pretty rad. And can you go back and track his musical career after this? Was he uh, did it change his life? I haven't actually gone. I would love to read like a, an autobiography or something like that of him. I mean, every one of his songs um, from Sledgehammer to Your Eyes, every one of them I've, I've gone back to and I've listened to the lyrics. And I'm like, all right, these are deeper than I remember them being. 
And it's it's not like out of the blue for me. I mean, I know that people back then were talking about some pretty deep stuff. I've been into Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and even the Doors and some other bands back then were talking about stuff that by today's standard would be considered like conscious music or like at least deep music. Um, but I don't know where like I feel like Peter Gabriel has always been that way. And like his last few records, they, they remind me of like Nine Inch Nails. They, they started getting some industrial vibe to him. And hmm. he's really like pushing the envelope of certain genres. So mad respect for Peter Gabriel. That's cool. I like, uh, I like sort of rediscovering things that, that were just radio played noise before in my youth. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I liked Sledgehammer. I remember when I first heard it and I saw that music video. I don't know if you ever saw it. It was like the claymation. Um, there's like a, a, a chicken, a plucked chicken without a head dancing around. And then like he has like a cake face and then it gets smashed by a sledgehammer or it melts or something like that. And it's just the eyes left over look, looking around. And I remember thinking like, that's creepy. And I almost feel like for me, the music video detracted a little bit from the song itself. Like if they were to update the video and make it less like just creepy weird, I'd be, I'd be much, I'd have been much more into that song back then. I imagine. Is this MTV? Like, were you watching MTV? Yeah, it was an MTV thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Um, where you want to start today? Peter Gabriel, Gabriel. <laughs> or wherever. <laughs> Are we, yeah, we're, we're already started. Um, <clears throat> let's let's see, let's see, let's see. I was just watching your interview on George Nori about psychedelics. Uh, obviously, that's you got that, that psychedelic poster right over your shoulder there. I mean, it's a, yeah, appropriate. <laughs> Picking her nose. <laughs> <laughs> That was a fun one because George really wasn't uh, he wasn't into it. You could tell he was old school and he was like, you know, so these are drugs. These are these are bad, right? These are dangerous, right? <laughs> it's like, George, I don't, I don't think you understand what I'm talking about. He's great. I love him, but he's, he's definitely old school and he's, he's got some funny ways about him. What do you think of the interview? Uh, I'm about halfway through, but I noticed your ability to bring in all kinds of other references. It's actually, it's, it's very Joe Rogan-esque in, in a sense. I've been binging on a lot of his, but you were, you were talking about, okay, we saw all these people bending over, looking at their cell phones, like, Ooh, let's, let's mention the fascia, which is a, you know, a fiber optic communication system. Like that's not necessarily r- related, but you're, you're weaving in all this evidence, which I always appreciate. Yeah. Well, that's uh so I have another show on Gaia called limitless and I, I, also weave in a lot of those topics as well. So I, I talk about psychedelics, but I don't talk about psychedelics because it's, it's hip and it's rising and trending and stuff like that. Um, I talk about it because it is one of the many tools out there um, that I think are really powerful when used correctly in expanding consciousness and building towards our, our higher potential. So I talk about, you know, what is human potential? And I, I think that we are, you know, I go so far as to say we are immature magicians. We don't realize we manifest our own lives and we don't realize we co-create reality as well. And therefore, in our immature state, we don't realize that in our complaining in our heads about the world and things along those lines, um, we're also, we're repeating that narrative in our head. We're creating that narrative. We're looking for evidence to back it up. And um, we'd rather feel comfortable in our comfort zone than uncomfortable branching out and expanding out of that comfort zone and seeing what else there is. So in that conversation, I wasn't trying to, so that was, I was working at Gaia and they were like, Hey, do you want to go on George Nuri's show? We need a guest to talk about psychedelics. That's, that's hip. It's not really in George Nuri. George loves talking about UFOs and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And um, I knew that, I also didn't want to just be the psychedelics guy, you know, the guy who's just, you know, Oh, now he's talking about psychedelics. So I like bringing in the other things that I'm all about and fascia. There's just something cool about fascia, you know, in anatomy, we, we looked at it as just the packing material. 
It's like, oh, when, when you're cutting open a cadaver, that's the stuff, that's the tough stuff you need to cut away to get to the good stuff, like the liver and the kidneys and, and those types of things. Um, and fascia only recently has come to be now the most interconnected organ in the body. And it's actually starting to be considered an organ. And it has, uh, let's see if I can get this right, because um, there's proprioception and then there's, um, is it notria, nociception? Uh, maybe you would un- understand that. Do you know? Like, so I, I know the term you're, you're trying to go for there. Uh, it's it's so basically like- nociception or nociception. It has to do with being able to sense what's happening happening from within i believe yeah right you know and so fascia connects with every other organ system and we're just now starting to understand that it it can share light which is information so if it acts fiber optically and it can share information throughout the body if you have healthy fascia then it communicates faster than your nervous system which is about the speed of a Ferrari, like 250 miles an hour, whereas the fascia can communicate faster. So then it's like, have you ever had something graze past your foot and you get spooked and you retract real quick and you actually react quicker than you could if it was your nervous system sending the signal to your brain and then your brain saying, oh, react. It's reacting faster than it would. And so right now, here we have a mechanism that could explain that. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to lay that on George Nuri and see what he thinks. <laughs> the UFO guy. We had um, Andrew Miles on on the show, and he was talking about he's a he's an acupuncturist. Uh, one of the things that he does, and he was talking about um, acupuncture stimulating the gas molecules, um, nitric oxide, and perhaps oxygen and other signaling molecules, which are sort of intracellular, um, with the fascia and, and to actually that those signaling molecules are, are closely tied to acupuncture as well. So we've got light and uh, gases. Interesting. I have, uh, so I, right before I made limitless, I went deep and I talked about this, that there are, um, several peer reviewed articles that were seeing what they could do to link up traditional Chinese um, meridian charts with myofascial trains. So um, there's this guy, Tom Myers, who he, his whole body of work is called anatomy trains. And it's all about the, there's, I think 11 specific trains that fascia runs through the body and it runs in these sequences. And he started like basically re-delivering an idea of what the anatomy is instead of Oh, man, however many muscles we think we have, like, let's say 200 muscles, instead of having 200 isolated muscle groups, you actually have 11 muscles in packed inside 11 myofascial trains. Mm-hmm. So they operate independently of one another, but they are part of like 11 muscle systems within these 11 myofascial trains. And the fascia also weaves through all the muscles so it, it not only it transports some kinds of um, proteins as well, possibly information, but it also it wraps around all the muscles, through the muscles, around every organ. And in fact, it's the reason why our cartilage by age 10 isn't, you know, completely demolished, like between our knees, because <laughs> the fascia actually pulls us up into our posture rather than bricks stacking on bricks. Cause you know, the old idea of the anatomy is, you know, your bones stack on top of one another and they're really pressing down, but something is pulling them away. So synovial fluid can get in there and that's the fascia. So I found that super interesting because I'm all about frequency and vibration. Um, not just in a woo woo way, but understanding that, you know, everything when you break it down does have some kind of like core, frequency or network of frequencies to them. So bones would be like almost like the guitar and the strings would be the fascia and the health of your fascia is maybe, it, maybe this isn't too much of a leap saying almost the tuning of your instrument. So that's when I started really getting into, well, I want to find out what diet 
helps your fascia. I want to find out what kind of movement helps your fascia. So I got into functional patterns. That's a form of movement that really honors the way your fascia is meant to move and link throughout the body. So if you're going to throw something, this retracts back and your front hip moves forward. And that creates a chamber, which is like a rubber band thing. And that motion goes all the way down to the bottoms of your feet as well. So like in sports, and I'm huge into movement and things like that, I started realizing that any way you move your body, you are affecting other parts of your body. And just the last thing I'll say, just to nerd out on this, is um, the most complicated bone in the human body is this phenoid bone. And it's if you were to take off the front part of the face, it's the thing that ba- it's the last bone that you would take off before you'd start seeing brain. And it's shaped like a, let's say an owl in a okay. way. It's got wings and almost like this beak thing at the, at the front of it. And the optic uh, chiasm where your optic nerve goes back in there and it flexes. So it's a really unique bone, but it only flexes um, if you have proper gait cycle. So as you're walking, it creates this kind of flexing motion that milks or like palp, you know, palpitates the um, pineal and pituitary complex. So Frankie Burgett, she's a body worker out of Texas, and she started noticing that people who have improper posture or improper gait cycle, they start having their sphenoid bones stop flexing. And that stops creating that, mo- that kind of like milking action. And it creates downstream effects because that's your master endocrine gland. And all the rest of your endocrine glands really, you know, balance your hormones. So she was noticing depression, anxiety, you know, just tons of hormonal issues, as well as like TMJ and lockjaw and things like that from improper gait cycle and improper posture and probably our sedentary society. So I was thinking like, my God, like we thought fascia was stupid. We thought it was packing material. And now it might be one of these keys to not just bring in our hormonal health back online, but sharing information through the body and just generally being badass. Like if you have good, healthy fascia, you're just generally going to have a better posture. And we know that two minutes of doing this, it lowers your cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and it raises your testosterone. It, it can help make you feel more confident in the moment, in your skin, allowed to take up your space and speak your mind. So Amy Cuddy on TED Talks was saying, do this before going into board meetings or breaking up with you know somebody if, if you are having a hard conversation with your kids or whatever it might be. It gives you more confidence. So to me, that was just like, well, that's a hack right there. That's, that's a biohack without needing some kind of supplement. Is that so, so you're specifically talking about like the starfish pose and taking up a lot of space. Is that connected to the fascia uh, in the sense that it's increasing testosterone and re- reducing cortisol? Well, it has to be everything you do. I mean, breathing and respiration affects your fascia. In fact, meditation has been lowered to actually relax the fascia, which allows more fluid and because fascia is just elastin, collagen, and ground substance, and it transports a ton of water. So you need to be well hydrated for that. But, you know, everything you do, if you breathe, it, it affects the levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen in your body. And the right ratio of that relaxes your fascia. And so everything you do, of course, if you put your hands up or arms up above your head in the victory pose, that's going to affect your post, your, your fascia. But look at what that's doing. What are most people doing most days? They're like this in front of the computer, clickety clack, right? So if you were to roll out of that, what would you do? Like, ah, kind of like that stretch. You're, You're rolling out of your sedentary posture. And think of what that hyperkyphosis, which is, you know, your, your shoulders pitch forward, your chest caves in, it crunches down on your abdomen, it limits the mobility of your diaphragm. And what does that do? That limits up to, according to some physicians, up to 30% of your oxygen intake. So then carry that further. If you limit 30% of your oxygen intake, what can that do to you? Well, that can cause anxiety. That can cause for all kinds of physiological and hormonal changes in the body. So this is actually like a healthy way to unravel that sedentary, hyperkyphotic, protective, you know, diminished posture. So when they say like 
this is like, when do you see people normally do this? Children do this when they, you know, they solve a problem or they do something and they're, they're celebrating. You see runners, like they win a race and they just throw their hands up in the air. It's the victory pose because there's something about it that we didn't need to be taught. We just naturally do that. We throw our hands up in the air. So there's something, I'm, I'm not going to try and like make a full like packaged, <laughs> you know, like this is a to-do list if you ever want to X, Y, and Z, but there's something about it. There, it's at least worthy of more inquiry. And I think it has to do with unraveling the posture that diminishes us as we're sitting in front of a computer, as most of us are doing most of the day. So there's got to be something to it. Yeah, I was out in California a couple of weeks ago, and um, one of the guys on this expedition was a, was a body worker. And he's like, yeah, let me give you a session. And I was like, sweet. And I was just telling him, you know, I have constant, you know, shoulder tension. And he's like, I think it's your diaphragm. And I was like, you know, that's interesting that you would diagnose it that quick. And he stuck his hand up under my rib, like back towards my spinal column. And, and it was like, you know, you feel like you're puking. And he was like, <sighs> and kind of like opened my ribs physically. And it was like, <gasps> oh my God, I can breathe. Like I can, like so much more air coming in. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, clear, clearly related to the fascia because it's also helped, you know, not just the neck, but like the hip and the knee. And so it's, all, you know, all this connected through the, through the diaphragm. It's totally connected. And, you know, what's interesting is, um, so injury, there are several things that can injure fascia and an injury to fascia doesn't mean it needs to be cut. Fascia with improper diet starts to become tacky and it starts to stick to one another. So imagine you have this shirt. I wish I had a sticker around here. If I were to put a sticker on this shirt and, and, or like, let's say a patch and iron it to it. And this shirt is stretchy. I can stretch it. But if I were to iron a patch to it, and then I try and stretch it, the stretching wouldn't be able to happen where that patch was. So all the fascia or tissue around that stuck together mass would have to overcompensate by stretching even more. So we do that when we are eating terrible food and sitting in a terrible posture for most of our life. Literally, people have been doing that now 10, 15, 20 years of their lives in front of a computer, you know, more because sitting is, you know, sitting has been around for quite some time. And now we're just doing it more often and more often. So if you think about it, what happens is your fascia becomes tacky. It sticks together. It loses its translucence, meaning light can't pass through it anymore. And then what posture does it, in a sense, um, what's the word, um, not become like concrete, but it, it hardens and ossifies, you know, so ossification, it sticks together and it hardens, it almost becomes as hard as bone, but it's fascia, it's supposed to be stretchy, but because of diet and lack of movement, it's actually, you're getting stuck in that posture. So have you seen old people walking down the street? where it looks like they're still sitting down, like they can't stand up fully. Sure. Their back is hunched over. That's their yeah. fascia doing that. Their fascia has ossified it. You know, it's basically turned almost into this like skeleton that holds them in the seated posture. And then, so they will have an even harder time and it'll become even more painful. And you might actually have to even induce fascial damage and harm just to loosen up the restrictions of it. So that's what it sounds like to me the the diaphragm when he did that and it loosened up all the intercostal fascia like it is probably because it started to become tacky and stick together and then harden in that way and i used to do what's called chine song it's abdominal massage it's a chinese form of abdominal massage mm. and you work with the fascia but it's the same thing you gotta it, it can be painful you gotta stick your fingers up under the ribs <laughs> uh towards the the liver and you're really working around all the way down towards the pelvis and up towards the ribs. And that helps loosen the fascia everywhere globally in the body because all of your fascia actually binds itself around your spine uh, to the crania, the cranium to the sacral. So the cranial sacral pump and cranial sacral therapy is one of the best things to, it's like a trick. It's better than massage to loosen up the fascia in your body. Massage will move lymph and it'll relax you, but cranial sacral therapy actually loosens up the fascia, which could probably have more long-term effects in like relaxing you. 
and it's you know that's what this body worker was uh of cranial sacral and i was surprised at how sort of uh when you're lying down on the table gentle and sort of slow and it's like like finger finger light touch it could be mm-hmm. I was like, is this really doing anything? Because I'm used to the sports massage, like take the Theragun and just like on the muscles, like, oh yeah. <laughs> jackhammer. That's, <laughs> that's how you know it's good. <laughs> totally, okay, totally. speaking of the jackhammer and vibration, uh, you know, like put an old person in a sauna, warm them up, get them to like shake around and dance and then hit them with a, you know, a Theragun or, or, or something. Like I would feel like that could loosen up the, the fascia. Totally. What you're doing in a sauna is you are not only you're causing the body to start releasing some of the heat shock proteins. And so your body also then starts uh, producing, I believe, some endorphins and things like that for pain release. So you can stretch deeper. And that also helps loosen the fascia. Some of these hormones help loosen the fascia. It augments your respiration as well, which helps loosen the fascia. So there are those things that you can do. But you definitely want to make sure you're getting enough magnesium and certain other electrolytes, hydrating a lot. And there's this, there's this other modality called um, Eldoa, and it's out of Colorado, I think. Um, and it's a way of basically just wringing out your fascia like a towel. So I think there's like maybe 11 different um, movements and manipulations that are like because you'll have fascia lines running through your arm and then zigzagging down your, your chest. You have one, your superficial back line goes from just about your toes back around your heel, up your calves, up your um, hamstrings, under your glutes, up your back, all the way up around your head and here. So if you were to like, you know, take, that's why I always keep, you know, lacrosse ball around. If you were to step on this and roll it around on your foot, it'll actually, it can take care of certain kinds of headaches and it can actually loosen your, your whole back superficial back line. And I, I remembered what I didn't say before when I was saying I was researching acupuncture meridians and the myofascial trains. What I didn't get to there was Several peer-reviewed articles say that we have it anywhere from a, an 80% to a 98% accuracy on where the traditional Chinese meridians, the meridian chart lies, and the myofascial trains in the body. So there's something about dry needling and more acupuncture than dry needling that is also myo, micro myofascial release. So as you're saying, like just, you know, finger touch light manipulations rather than the Theragun jackhammering away can be just as effective if it's precise, I would imagine. And this is me, not a doctor, not an acupuncture practitioner, you know, not even a body worker, even though I've, I've practiced and I've gotten a certificate in some of it. Um, Mm -hmm. I just like playing around with these things, but then I came to realize that maybe acupuncture and acupressure is a form of myofascial release because what is, what is myofascial release other than pressing hard on a piece of the train of myofascial tissue so you can get the entire train to release? So if you really, really press on it, and if you have you ever done dry needling? No, no, I haven't, but okay. I, I do have, I always keep one of those balls around. There's not one on my desk right now, but yeah, dry needling is almost like acupuncture, but they don't leave the needle in. So you find a spot where there's, um, your, your nervous system and your brain is keeping a form of tightness as a retracted muscle group builds a knot. And so they go in and they pop that and then they remove it. And what happens there is you will feel it radiating all throughout your body. That's because it's traveling the myofascial lines in the body. Mm-hmm. So you, but what you're doing is you're, it's not like myofascial release by like pressing until you get it to release. This is like popping it and the mind, the brain goes, okay, we're not in that traumatic state that caused it to 10 years ago when I was, you know, in MMA and I was constantly like up here all the time. That's why it's there, but I'm not in fight or flight anymore. So you pop it, it resets the brain to being like, okay, you don't need to keep that tension anymore. So there's all these little manipulations that I feel like I don't know. They, they've been called woo-woo for long enough, but I think there's something to them, but you have to be a good practitioner. So you can't just like go like, you know, oh, I, I think acupuncture is great. So I'm just going to grab a bunch of needles and, and just go to town on myself. You need to be precise about it and accurate. 
but I think there's something there and I'm all about the woo woo these days. <laughs> and, you know, like, so, so we're, we're in this sort of battle with our diet and gravity and travel and not getting enough sleep sometimes because we have kids and all kinds of things. And so we're in this sort of like constantly trying to help our bodies. At least I, I am, but it seems like a lot of people around me are like constantly healing from something, constantly trying to get back to a cleaner state. And it's a lot of work. And mm-hmm. so what's your, you know, how do you, how do you manage all like the work of your own body versus actually just trying to be productive? Cause I, I know you're also quite prolific in stuff that you create. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, it changes all the time. So I'm in my, my house is right next door. You've been here. My house is right next door. Here's my shop. Oh, you have a separate studio. Yeah. So when we were outside by the pool and everything, the, the, the house that you saw right next to it is actually just a big garage. Okay. And, and that's what, where this is. This is my office. And right outside here is a big open space. So I get out there, I'll skate around. I have battle ropes. I have kettlebells, medicine balls, small heavy ones to the bigger ones that you can bounce. I have the medicine balls on a rope so you can like smash it from side to side. Pair of balls, maces, those things. And um, hacky sacks. I mean, everything from light coordinated things to heavy smashing things. So when I realized that I've been working too much, and this is why I work for myself, because I, I, I can't have somebody else have to sign off on when I'm allowed to get up and go out and and move around. It need, it needs to be up to me Um, because sometimes I'll be sitting here and I'll be working and I'll be in the flow And then I'll just hit a point where like, I'm not as productive. I know what needs to get done, but I'm not as quick and I'm not as productive, nor am I as inspired. And I realize that's because, you know how we go through these sleep cycles, sleep cycles are somewhere around like 90 minutes. You have to honor those sleep cycles. And why most people wake up around two to three in the morning to pee is because that's an average time. Not only is your body working on certain organs at that time, But that's an average time where people are coming out of their sleep cycle. And some people sleep straight through it, but some others don't. Well, for me, when I'm working and I notice that like I've I've been like, let's say like deep diving in my work, but then my body's getting bored and the inspiration is losing and I'm starting to shift in my seat a lot more. Then I realize I'm not creative anymore because my body's like, all right, you've been focusing on that computer screen far too long. Why don't you get up and do something fun for me? So I'll get up and I'll skate around. And what's beautiful about that is I'll skate around and I'll, I'll take these aerobies. They're like giant Frisbees. And I'll throw them around. And sometimes I'll throw it really slowly and see if I can skate and catch it myself. Um, I try and do things that <laughs> challenge my body that don't really challenge my mind much. And what that does is it allows for all the heady intellectual editing or research work that I do to take a back seat. And that's what allows me to dissociate from it. And you know, when you're really trying to think of somebody's name and you can't, and you're like, oh, it'll come to me. And then later when you're not trying to think of it, it'll just naturally come to you. I feel like that's when I'm like, I've hit a brick wall in my creative work. I need to get up and move. I need to let my body start to celebrate. And when my body celebrates, it's not like I'm not working in the background. It's just, I'm, I'm celebrating with my body. I'm having fun. I'm breathing, I'm sweating. And then all of a sudden, I'll just get this awesome idea that was something that I know I couldn't have come up with had I sat in that chair for another 20 minutes, you know, getting up and moving for 20 minutes actually did the trick. I like that. My body needs to celebrate. It's a a good turn of phrase. At at least two to three times a day, my body needs to celebrate. And then I'll, I'll have that moment at the end of the day where like, okay, I still need to upload, upload all the stuff that I made but my kids are going to go to sleep in two to three hours. So I'm going to go jump on the trampoline with them or run around in the backyard or just have a deep dive with them. And then when they're down to sleep, I'll take 20 minutes and upload everything and then shut the computer. I try not to do tech work or, you know, artificial light work when I'm uh, about to go to sleep, but I just kind of pick and choose my battles. You know, I have, I have a ton of work to do. And a lot of the times I'm just stressed I need to get it done. I've placed the demand on myself. So I just 
make compromises. I'm like, yeah, but I took three hours off to play with my kids earlier. I'll spend 20 minutes at nine o'clock at night staring at a computer. That's, that's an okay compromise to me. Yeah. And do you think those uh, you mentioned those sleep cycles, those 90 minute sleep cycles, do you think that's still happening throughout your day where you have similar 90 minute cycles and then your body, you know, okay, 90 minutes of productivity. Now I'm bored and I need to move around. Is it the same? I guarantee it. I, I mean, like I know it in terms of melatonin, your melatonin production is a long, slow wave. It starts to go up around eight, nine, seven, eight, nine a or PM. It starts to start to climb. Even if you're not in darkness, it'll start to climb. But th- then there's artificial light that can dampen it for sure. But it'll start to peak. And then around four, five in the morning, it starts to taper off. And then it's low in, and then your body starts then producing cortisol. So it's like these like dueling waves, cortisol and melatonin. And then you have other things. Those are just two examples. Um, but everything's a wave pattern. Everything has a, a, um, a peak in a valley or a crest in a trough, as Alan Watt says. Um, everything has that kind of frequency thing to it. And we then use caffeine and we use different kinds of, you know, herbal or chemical remedies to augment those wave cycles or hyperpower those wave cycles. And I, I was just watching something today. Thank you, Instagram. Um, I, I forget who it was even. They were saying that caffeine doesn't give you energy. It, what it does is it, um, it dulls, I'm forgetting what receptors there are, but the, the receptors in the brain that basically translate the I'm tired feeling. So the, they, that's, they just keep you from the feeling ad. the natural feeling. They, they dim your ability to feel a natural feeling in your body. So yes, there are those, uh, they may not all be 90 minute cycles, but as you see, everything does have their cycles. And this is why siesta, you think of why siesta is a thing like, okay, after lunch, everyone go take a nap. I I remember when I used to do landscaping, um, we, we'd have like a bunch of white people and then there was the Mexicans and they would all go fall asleep under a tree um, after lunch. And I was like thinking like, man, I'd love to do that. And then I tried it one time. They were like, well, just come over and freaking take a nap afterwards. (laughs) And literally, (laughs) but how 15 (laughs) minutes, yeah, (laughs) 10 to 15 minutes, you don't even have to fall asleep, but it it resets you. So I think that's listening to your body and, um, and honoring those cycles. You don't have to go hog wild every single day. You don't have to perfect your siesta every single day, but if you honor it a little bit, I feel like that's like honoring your intuition. I think even your intuition is something that it can tell if you're listening to it or not. And if you don't honor it by listening it, then it'll, it'll stop talking so loud. But if you start honoring it, it'll start speaking to you more and you can develop more of a language with it. So, so, you know, thank you, my landscaping career for, you know, helping teach me these, these little things. I mean, the other thing about siesta is, that's when it's hot. And I lived in Spain and it was freaking hot. Spain is hot. And is hot. You, you don't want to be out there. You know, like the first time I tried to go grocery shopping at 3 p.m. and it was, nobody's there. It's, you know, the store is closed. You're like, it's normal business hours. What are you doing? And then you're like, oh, it's so damn hot. So, yeah, you know, part of it is just like, why not be in the shade? For sure. And you, you just ate. Right. Your body wants to digest. It doesn't want to get back to landscaping. You know, evolution didn't prepare your body to do that. (laughs) So it kind of wants to take a nap. And if you think about it, I've studied indigenous cultures. For the most part, indigenous cultures replete and ubiquitous throughout all of them. By today's standards, they would be considered lazy. They don't work all day long. They actually are closer to Tim Ferriss than anything. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they do their work and then they lounge and, they, and they, they appreciate it. But it's not all just lazy. We got nothing better to do. Um, a lot of the times I think that's got to be honoring those natural cycles. I also want to ask, where in Spain were you? I was down in Malaga, southern, southern coast. Oh, okay. No, I haven't been that south. So that's hot. That's, I, that's luckily, I was there in the winter, uh, which so it's like sometimes pretty perfect. I was there because it's a great place to train in the off season for cycling. So you can, is you that can what ride you were doing outside there, every day. Training? 
Yep. Yep. Training and training and racing bikes. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yep. I've only been more Northern Madrid. Um, what was the other one where they have all the uh, Gaudi houses? Barcelona. Um, yeah. 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 And then it beat the, um, I think we were going to go up to, um, I forget somewhere up closer to the Pyrenees, but, uh, love Spain, love traveling around Spain and Ibiza. the, Actually, first, when, when we were pregnant with my daughter, um, my wife and I traveled out there and spent quite some time there. And your, your wife is Dutch, right? Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Met her in Amsterdam and she, she fucked me up, man. <laughs> <laughs> I left there sick as a dog without any sleep thinking, huh, Dutch girls. All right. <laughs> Enough said. And then shortly after that, we were, uh, we were traveling road tripping around the country going to burning man uh, my band just played its last show we did a big festival with saliva lita ford great white and i forget a couple other 80s bands and then just hightailed at the burning man and uh the rest is the rest is history so you've got a you've got a really interesting life trajectory because i seem to remember you're in the military you're yeah. in a band you're, you know, here we are talking about fascia and psychedelics, uh, you're a filmmaker, uh, pretty, okay. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can weave this all into a, a coherent question. Um, pr- pretty weaving and turning to, to some degree. And the last thing you said about your intuition, uh, can tell if you're listening to it. So maybe could you tell me a time when you listen to your intuition and it sort of changed your trajectory just to some degree hmm yeah you know i'm 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 almost at a phase or i feel like i'm at that crossroads again too because usually it's when i'm listening to my intuition and it takes a while it's because it's telling me to either abandon something that i've found is part of my identity um and i don't know how to set it down, not even abandon it, I guess, just set it down for a while or, or pick up another uh, journey. Um, or it's telling me to take up another journey that I've always found like, oh, that's not me. I, it just can't be me. Um, I would say when I was in a band, so I was in a band called Hyrosonic. I was touring nationally with this band and I was pretty outspoken. So I was in the military when we started the band. I was in the military for a good four or five years while I was in the band. And we had already done Lollapalooza. We were constantly touring. And I was in the guard, so I wasn't working full time. And they were super supportive, interestingly enough. The military loved it. They mm. were super supportive of it. Um, and then <clears throat> I got out of the military and I was allowed to then have an opinion. I was allowed to speak out about things going on in the world. So I just started becoming very vocal, but I hated the overly intellectual speaking out about the world. I like doing it more poetic, like musically. And so people were like, I had a lot of fans saying like, could you, could you explain some of the lyrics, some of the message of your band? And so I felt I, I've always been like, you know, everything, uh, everything's too passe for me. You know, like, I'm not just going to explain it. I got to do a piece of art. I got to make a documentary to tell you what it is, you know, about, the um about the world that i'm speaking about so i had this intuition that i should start making film not films not become a filmmaker but start making film and to to answer this question and so i was like all right i'm gonna make a film about the band i i I already commoditized it in my head like How's it going to serve? What role is it going to serve? What function is it going to play in the band? How's it going to get us to the next step? I was already commodifying it. I wasn't doing it for the love of. Mm, And my intuition was telling me, like, let go of what you think this film is. And it turned from what I thought was going to be a 15-minute short film about the band, about the message of the band, And then it turned into a two hour, six minute documentary that had nothing to do with the band. And it like the first hour and a half of it was conspiracy. And I always found conspiracy to be highly annoying, to be perfectly honest. And 
I was just railing on all these things. And like, I was doing all this research, but it's not like I researched for 10 years prior. I just started researching and everything I felt the intuition to click on. And this was like back, you know, it was Yahoo more than Google at the time. And YouTube wasn't even a thing, but everything I clicked on. So I was like, you know, at first I was talking about the Mayan calendar and the distortion of, you know, uh, the lunar calendar and how we look at time today. And then it started getting into the founding fathers and their connections with secret societies. And then it started getting into um, the date of 9-11, the date that we invaded Afghanistan, the, the date of the Iraq war and all these things lining up with Mayan calendar dates. And so I was just going ham on it. And then I, I started clicking on like law, like, okay, wh what do I want to learn about law? What's this admiralty law thing? And I started realizing really breaking apart what law is and what the legal language is. So long story short, it was this hodgepodge of research, but somehow it was stream of consciousness enough to where people understood where I was going with it. And so I was following my intuition. And then eventually I, I, I was just putting 15 minute clips of it up on Google videos and as I was doing that, Google videos predated YouTube and you could only upload 15 minutes until, you know, until or unless some status of yours got to a certain level, then you could upload two hour things. So I was just uploading 15 minute pieces of it. And without my understanding, these were getting like 15, 20, 50,000 views. And I was like, I only sent this to like 15 people. So I had no concept of what viral was. I don't even think I, under, I, I knew the term viral. And um, people started hitting me up saying, when are you going to finish this film and upload it in its entirety? And that's when I realized like, ooh, I don't want to make a conspiracy film or just a conspiracy film. I need to have a twist ending at the end. So at the very end, I put in this very inspirational, hopeful, like, if you're scared of what's happening in the outside world and what I'm telling you, then you're forgetting that we are the most badass, you know, technology in the universe. The human being is so much. Better. So I turned it into this inspirational, like, look at your own human potential ending. And I put it up online halfway through the year, six months later, there was, you know, well over a million. I think there was 2 million views on that video, but it had been shared and uploaded um, to, I think, 15, 20 other yeah, sites. And there was a grand total of like 20 million views on oh. Esoteric Agenda alone. And so that in and of itself, people were asking me to come do speaking gigs, one of which was in Amsterdam where I met my now wife. Um, these films led to my working at Gaia. These films led to all the speaking gigs, a lot of friends that I have now, me living in Nashville right now, um, having lived in Boulder, Colorado, having gone to Northern California and started trimming pot, you know, in Northern California after Burning Man. But then these people recognized my voices and they were like, wait a minute, you made Chimatica. You made Esoteric Agenda in Chimatica. And I was like, yeah. And so they brought me into their inner circle. They brought me directly into like the tippity top of the, the weed growing community there. Met some of the most amazing people in my life because I followed my intuition to not make that film about my band to just stream of consciousness. Wow. And that is my career now. That's, that's what psychedelic is. That's, you know, part and parcel to why I did the interview that triggered the, the guy to, you know, bring me down to Nashville. The guy who brought me down to Nashville um, put us up in this house. It, it just incredible things started to kind of spiral out of that. So that was me following my intuition. And from there, I've always been a guy who like, if, if there's a cool opportunity to do something, I'm going to say yes to it. But now I'm, I'm, I'm selective. I, I don't just say yes to everything. If my intuition is like, ooh, you'll learn something, then it's a yes. If my intuition is like, Ben, you've done this before. Like, why would you say yes to this? You've done this before. You know what's behind that curtain. Then I'm like, oh, sorry, no. And then when I say no to things, usually something else comes up in its place from the same person or somebody else out of the blue. And all of a sudden, it'll lead to a new project and a new contract and a new direction in my life. So honestly, like I've, I've 
surrendered to the flow and I'm not limp on this wave. You know, I'm surfing it like a surfer is not completely limp, but they're not trying to control the wave. They're letting the wave do what the wave does. And they're just using just enough rigidity to not be limp and fall over. So that's kind of how I've looked at my life. Like I'm surfing my intuition by only having the right amount of control, controlling, right? I I surrender the rest and it just seems to take me in the right direction. Now it's, it's also led to rock bottom. It has led to rock bottom, but that rock bottom was also necessary. And that was 2019, right after I had my twins. Uh, I never wanted to make films again. Uh, I thought I was just going to go back to landscaping, to be perfectly honest. And then my wife was like, all right, Ben, I know you. You go back to landscaping. You're going to be happy for two weeks. You're going to come home every day saying, yay, I'm getting sun and I'm doing exercise and blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to be miserable and you're going to realize that you let your soul down. And then that's going to make me miserable. And then the kids are going to be miserable. And she was like, it's not worth it. Just just keep doing what we set out to do. You got to follow your passion. And so my films led me to my wife, who then led me back into my path of filmmaking. It's, it's strange <laughs> how that happens. Wow. And this story is such an emotional roller coaster for me. And I'm sure other people listening, because you're like, wow, I just, you know, isn't that so easy that you just made this film and then like all these doors open for you and somebody gave you a house and you got to meet all the people. It's like, oh, you know, I wish, you know, something like that would happen to me. And then you're like, and it also led to rock bottom. I'm like, okay, uh, still don't, now, now I don't necessarily want to take your own journey, but it's, it is, it is very inspiring. And I notice you know, there's a certain amount of like, ah, oh, I want, I want things to just happen super easily for me and like be in the flow and just like have my purpose just like rain down on me uh, yeah. whenever I am confused. Yeah, man. What does that feel like? That feeling um, where it's, it's grace an intervention of grace. You know, what's strange about the films is um, I, I surprised myself with what I allowed myself to talk about in the films, mm. but then I also, I didn't let go of, and I, I, I didn't feel to let go of um, who I used to be in the band. And so as I was making the films, I wasn't just trying to make a film that can tickle your intellect. I I made the soundtrack to the film because I wanted it to be something that was moving, mind bending, inspiring, like hypnotic, like, holy shit. I don't just feel this up here. I I feel this in my heart because it's humble because I really wanted my voice to come across very humbly. Like, hey, I don't have your answers. I'm not telling you what to believe you know, yeah, go and do your own research, but more than that, like be you, be authentically you. So I was trying to hit people in the heart, but then I was also trying to move people like music moves you, you know, like music, if, if it's good, it, it, it doesn't even have to be your focal point of attention. You can find yourself, you're doing something and there's music in the background. And then you start nodding your head. That music is subconsciously moving your body, literally moving your body. You want to move to it. It's, taking you over somehow, right? If we were all, you know, Spock and we were all super intellectual, we would say, oh, that's a form of brainwashing. But like, you can't say that the brainwashing is bad. Like we want to be moved by things. We want our purpose to rain down on top of us. So what I did with the films that I think, what I honored by saying yes to the films and doing it in the way that I wanted to, I didn't do it in some David Icke or Alex Jones way where it was like, you guys better watch out because there's a depopulation scheme coming. You know, it wasn't any of that. I wasn't trying to scare people. I wanted to inspire the shit out of people. And I wanted to do it through unconventional means. I wanted to inspire people with conspiracy. And that's why I put a twist ending at the end of it. I was, I, I wanted people to realize like, okay, you kind of need this impetus to be like, oh shit, maybe the world isn't what I thought it was. Maybe reality isn't what I think it is. And that leads to this kind of stress response. And then you remind yourself, or I help through the music and through the words, remind the audience, you're a badass. You're a human being. It's choice. You have the choice to do whatever you want with this information. And I feel like we're all coming together. So I obeyed this feeling that was like, I feel like something, some underground movement is happening and it's not an underground movement with some like leader. 
it's this thing that's like in the air. It's this epiphenomena that's happening. And so I felt it. <laughs> I honored it. I made a film around it. And those films hit people in just the right way. I feel like it was the right time, the right place, the right message, the right nuance of how I said the message that led to people saying, dude, I'll book an entire tour throughout all of Europe for you. You know, just, just come on over. I'll, I'll buy your plane ticket. I'll book the entire tour. You'll aid. We'll take care of all the nuances. And to me, that's like, oh yeah, badass, badass, badass. And it was all hard work, but it all came from, had I not said yes to that nuance and listened the entire way through to that nuance, had I been like, nah, I got to make sure my band is benefited by these films. None of this shit would have happened. I guarantee it. None of this would have happened had I tried to make that a commodity for the band. I had to do it altruistically. I didn't ask for any money. I didn't even put my name on it at first. I had people, literally, I wish I had the DVD in front of me. I had, uh, there's behind you. Here's Chimatica back here, this DVD. Okay. I had people taking that DVD, Photoshopping my name off the top of it, me and my brother's name off the top of it, because my brother helped me putting their name and production company on it and selling it and making more money than I made. And I would email them and I'd be like, hey, just to let you know, I, I'm not going to come after you with lawyers or anything, but the filmmaker who made that film knows what you're doing. So I'm just putting you on call man to man. I know what you're doing and I hope you're not stuffing your pockets and doing something greedy with that money. I hope you're actually doing something for humanity because I made these films for humans. Actually, afterwards, I let people steal the content, take chunks of the film, put it in their film, not even give me credit and make films with my content because I was like, this is a huge movement. People got to do this. We, we got to show people that like art can be used in this way to wake people up. And I don't want a damn dime from any of you. Just use the same heart. Use the same heart in the message. So I really do believe that like, had I tried to commodify the films from the start. Like, yeah, I'm going to be a filmmaker and I'm going to go on tour. Had I wanted to do it, I guarantee you none of it would have happened. When you called those people and, and said, I hope you're doing something good. What happened from those conversations? They took their website down and never emailed me back. Two of them, at least. I, I emailed three or four of them. The one that photoshopped like literally kept the same artwork but photoshopped my name off of it and put theirs on it um they within three days they took their website down and i i hope it wasn't so they could just move shop and do it somewhere else i hope that the way that i put that message to them because i didn't want to be macho i didn't want to be like yo i'm coming for you i didn't want it to have that vibe to it i wanted to be like yo did you watch the film did you, did you feel what I was getting at? Like, this is about something real that's happening on planet Earth. It's something that's it's serious, you know, and it, it, it needs our caring for. So I hope you didn't just take this film just to make money off of it. I hope you're all trying to do something like, okay, you did something shitty. You stole my film. You put your own name on it. But I'm not even, I wasn't even focusing on that. I was just like, I hope you're doing something good with all that money. So my hope is that they took down their website and did, I don't know, made a film or, you know, changed the direction in their life or just decided to do something better. I don't know. Like, yeah. that was my hope, but I didn't hear back from any of them. Okay. Interesting. That would be, you know, if, if, if I had done something like that and someone emailed me, that'd be super confronting, you know, like, like oh shit, you know? Yeah. Um, what's the, what's the role for you or I, I feel like uh, the, the rise of people's awareness of conspiracy theories in the last couple of years. And it's, I don't know how old your film is 10 years or, or something like that or, or more even uh, 13 years ago. I, I, well, it was 2008 that I launched esoteric agenda. It was January of 2009 that I launched um, Chimatica. So yeah, 12, 13 years ago. Okay, so that was like people were starting to dig into the global financial collapse. Like, what the hell is going on? But now there's like probably a, a lot more mainstream conspiracy theory has has come mainstream. So, what's your relationship to conspiracy uh, currently? You know, it's funny. I was just watching Bill Burr on Conan O'Brien. 
Um, right. And he was talking. Conan was like, did you get the did you get the vaccine? And he was like, yeah, I got it. And he was like, and I don't think there's any conspiracy behind it. And it was kind of funny. Like I, I was waiting for the funny parts. And he was just like, you know, I don't think it's like I just I don't see it. You know, I've been into conspiracies in the past, but, you know, now it's like all of a sudden, you know, we're trying to kill off all the people that are compliant. Like that doesn't make any sense. Kill off the Fonzies that are too cool to listen to people. And I was listening to that today and I was like, you know what? That's what I like more than anything. I'm not really into conspiracy, to be honest. I like art that moves people. Conspiracy just happened to be a way circa 2008, 2009 to really confront people like George Carlin. Okay. He wasn't just nice and funny, right? He was confronting. He would confront you with some pretty harsh stuff and then he would make it funny. That was really the way that I was trying to go with my films was confront you with something that's not easy and then move you inspirationally. So nowadays, people are lumping me in because I made conspiracy films 12, 13 years ago. They're lumping me in with flat earthers, QAnon, you know, like if just I'm trying to think of a bunch of the other ones and like Mandela effect and blah, blah, blah. And that in 2012, the world actually ended because the CERN super collider opened up the God particle or something like that. And now we're in a simulation. I started getting lumped in with all these and I'm like, man, I miss the good old days, the good old conspiracies with the good old Bavarian Illuminati depopulation schemes. And, you know, like I miss that shit. Now it's like we're talking about flat earth with an ice rim around it. And QAnon and Trump is in on some, you know, let's save people and take care of pedophilia and, you know, all this kind of stuff. To me, I started realizing that I don't believe 95 per, well, I, I'm not going to put a number on it because it could be lower than that. But I would say like 90% of the conspiracy theories that I hear about today are just complete hogwash. They're complete hogwash. And a lot of it is apophenia. A lot of it is like, do you remember John Benet Ramsey who went missing in Colorado when she was yeah, a little girl? Yeah, that little girl, yep. And there's conspiracy films saying it's actually Lady Gaga. She was put in MK Ultra and turned into Lady Gaga. And I'm like, are you just saying that because she has blonde hair? I, I don't get it. And then they're like, remember Johan, Johan Vandersloot, the guy who um, killed, I forget what her name was, but it was a girl in Jamaica. Okay. Or, you know, something like that. And then like there was it, his dad was some like rich lawyer or something and he got off. And then 10 years later to the day, you know, he had some hooker that, you know, realized, oh, it's you. And he beat her to death. And now he's finally in jail. There's people saying that that's Jacko from Steve, uh, Jacko, Steve-O from Jackass is what I was trying to say, <laughs> you know. And so I start realizing that like a lot of it's apophenia. A lot Wait, of what is this for, term? Apophenia? Apophenia is putting um, puzzle pieces together that don't belong together. So you're, you're coming up with data points that are correct, but it's like connect the dots, right? If you don't connect the correct dots with the other correct, connect, correct dots, then it's going to paint a, a different picture, right? So apophenia is like, well, I saw a picture with Lady Gaga next to somebody in a bloodbath. So, and I heard this thing about adrenochrome. So that must be adrenochrome. So Lady Gaga must be drinking adrenochrome with Hillary Clinton. Cause I read an article saying that Hillary Clinton is drinking green adrenochrome. That's like taking all these data points and just making connections. That's apophenia. I think a lot of conspiracy theories today are people illegitimately making too many leaps of faith to connect things to one another. And then the rest of it, I think QAnon and Flat Earth are actually intelligence agency pushes. If they didn't start there, because I can completely see how you can question reality to the point where you're like, you know, maybe Earth isn't round and maybe the stars aren't what they are. And like, I've been there. I've, I've, I've like, whoa, what if we're actually inside the eyeball of, a, you know, or what if it's actually concave Earth and, you know what I mean? I've I've gone there before, but then I come back to sobriety and I'm like, yeah, it's it's cool to go there, but it's also better to come back home and not stay out there. Um, I think QAnon was intelligence agencies from the start. 
to take down Donald Trump, uh, you know, and I think it's massive culmination was January 6th with the insurrection. Um, I, I'm not going to try and prove that because I could be wrong. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with being wrong about it. I just have a hunch that QAnon was intelligence agencies almost all the way. I think Flat Earth turned into an intelligence agency op. And I think a lot of these things are put out there to make, you know, yeah. Are you into conspiracy theories, right? Like, you know, do you, know, do, do you get into QAnon? Do you get into Flat Earth? Do you get into child sex trafficking being higher up in, in the government and, you know, you know, like 9-11 and stuff like that. So it's like you take all these things and you lump them together and you've already put the turd in the punch bowl. So even though there may be some truth in there somewhere, now it all looks like crap. Now, most people are so overwhelmed. They're like, well, I don't want to look at any of it. So if it even has the term conspiracy theory attached to it, I don't even want to look at it. I'm just going to make fun of it. And that's how you can get people to self-police and mm, yeah. you don't need to do it top down. You just make it look so ludicrous that, and you make it popular for other people to make fun of it. And therefore we're self-policing each other. And that to me is not beyond imagination that, you know, um, elites. And when I'm saying elites, it's not any particular elites. It's just anyone with excessive wealth, resource, and power realize that, well, if I were to come out and say that this stuff is ridiculous, everyone would be like, well, of course you would because you're the guy implicated. So make other people self-police and make it look ridiculous and turn in a punch bowl. That's what I think most of conspiracy is circa 2020, 2021, most conspiracy. But some of the bigger ones today, I think there's truth to them, you know, and I, I pull no punches. I just don't talk about it on every show. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like, it's, it's very classical. Uh, I, I think what I learned from sort of the UFO community is like you, you blend elements of truth in there uh, with enough sort of ludicrous discrediting things that, that people throw out the truth um, or, or just don't want to, don't want to deal with it. Cause it is so, it is so messy. And then you're, you know, that's the other thing is like, okay, well, flat earth should be a, a really easy thing to, to verify, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just, you just go up and you look at the earth and if it's round, if it's a globe, then it's a globe, right? It's a super simple theory to <laughs> disprove. Right. Um, and, and there's, there's many things uh, like, like a debate about masks. Like you could just go read the research of whether they actually work or, or not and, and make your right. decision. Um, and, and yet that's like a step too far. Like I can't go up to space to actually do that. Um, if you don't know how to read a scientific paper, you can't go, you don't even know where to look to read basic research about masks or vaccines or anything like that. So then you're relying on second, third hand interpretations to try to build your, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to do some critical thinking. I'm going to like have a, have a nice discussion here. I'm going to like do my own research and your own research is, is limited by like what you can actually verify for yourself. Mm hmm and it's all online now. No one's going to the library anymore. You know, the, another thing about that is, is I think we're most of us operating from a faulty premise. And to me, why do I read things that expand my mind? You know, like, of course, I love to feel like I'm right about things. You know, I read so I can, you know, not just feel like I'm right, though. Another thing I do is to expand my horizons and it, it helps with my creativity. So I think a lot of people, we, we operate under the faulty premise that we need to homogenize belief, what we believe in. And you're not, it's, it's not good to believe in other things. I actually, I could hang out with a flat earther. I don't care. You know, if they're a good person, which a lot of them, unfortunately, I, I know what they're dealing with because they get so angry. They get so angry. Why won't anyone believe me? Well, it, I think it's because you're operating from a faulty premise. You're operating from the premise that you will feel validated once other people believe you, once critical mass believes you. I don't care if people believe me. I, I never made films for people to believe me. I made films to move people. That's the big difference. I don't care if people believe me. And to be perfectly honest, I considered 
whether the earth was flat. I went and I looked at the research and it just didn't pan out. And there's, uh, I'll say this, like most of the things that I looked at that were like, oh, that's, that is pretty interesting. And the more I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't prove the earth is flat. It's just an interesting anomaly. And then, so this kind of like what you're saying is like, you have this premise and people want to be the ones who are, some people want to be the ones who are discovering something before other people. It's like discovering a band before other people. Discovering like, a continent. I was, I was a flat earther before it was cool, before it hit a million <laughs> followers. <laughs> I think people are operating on a premise that we need a world full of homogenous beliefs. And I'm like, no, we need diversity. I don't care if the, the earth is flat. Can we create a beautiful world together? That's what I care about. Because like, I've, I've known plenty flat earthers and we've jammed and we've made music and it's made nights beautiful. And people went home thinking, wow, what great people, what great music. I feel great. I love being alive. And these people that may have been depressed before, right? They go home and they feel like, wow, man, I love being alive. It reminded me why I love life and just celebrating life. That was a flat earther. They helped you. Thank you. We don't need homogenous beliefs. It doesn't matter what they believe. And I think now it's all about facts and misinformation and, and everything's about like the danger of believing the wrong thing. Believing the wrong thing. Like, okay, it can kill you. It can, but it doesn't always kill you. And by and large, we as a species thought the earth was flat for a long, long time before we started thinking it was round. And I, I mean, I'm convinced it's a cube or at least a hologram or something like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like beyond that, how many people died because they didn't believe the earth was round before when they thought it was flat? You know, how many people, their life was ruined? Like, oh, those poor children that believed that the earth was flat before Galileo and Copernicus and, right? You know, like these beliefs aren't killing us. So we don't need to homogenize all of our belief systems together. I love the diversity of it. I think what we're missing is harmony. Like what I was talking about with music, can we harmonize with one another? And, you know, to me, like I can find harmony with a flat earther, with somebody who believes in QAnon, with somebody on the left side or the right side of the political paradigm, with an anarchist, with somebody who, you know, believes the world is flat, with others who believes it's a simulation. I can... I can harmonize with any of them. I don't need them to believe what I believe. So I just wanted to say that about like, I think we're operating from a faulty premise, ergo, when we're trying to be right. Can't you just look at the evidence? Can't you just, you know, like, no, you're looking at the wrong thing on Google. Didn't you read Snopes? You know, all this stuff that people are getting hung up on, like you're bringing disharmony into a situation for a reason that does not really affect the quality of your life. That's, that's me, at least. I believe that people are falling for something hook, line, and sinker that is tearing apart the fabric of our society. We've always had rifts between the left and the right. You know, We've always had that. But there's something that's causing for us to hate, not just distrust our neighbors, but hate our neighbors, absolutely hate them, wish that they would literally get sick and die, right? Why? because of something on Fox or CNN. Like that's why, because a story. And so to me, that's why I got into filmmaking is stories can liberate or enslave if it moves you, if it really moves you. And music is a part of that. Music in movies is a big part of the subconscious programming or liberation of film. So to me, I just had to say that because I think most people today, when they're thinking about conspiracy theories, they're getting hung up on the wrong thing. I don't care what people believe. I want to see harmony. And that can come with diversity. Actually, that should come with diversity. It shouldn't come with segregation of beliefs, ideas, skin color, you know, you know what you want to do to your body, put technology in your body, cut parts off your body. Doesn't really matter to me. Like we're we're talking about things like transgender today. Like, have you seen what indigenous have done with scarification and self mutilation and things like that? It's not huge. It's Spartans were throwing babies off of cliffs because they weren't perfect, right? You know. So we have a long history of this. I feel like we're missing the real point of what life is. So there's my rant. <laughs>
I had to go. Yeah, no, that's, that's powerful. And, And it's reminding me of, you know, one of my, one of my mentors is a shaman and he's always, he pops into my mind like multiple times a day. Like, is your line of thinking leading you to peace? Like, is what you're doing keeping you in a state of peace? And whenever I, you know, I'm like, oh, this is not, this is not peaceful. This argument, this like uh, getting worried about the deep state or whatever it is. It's like, that's not peaceful at all. And I'm not as functional when I'm not at peace. And so that's, right. you know, I always just keep coming back to that. And when you're in a state of peace, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, okay. There's maybe some evidence one way or the other. Um, but yeah. And, before we before we move on there's actually one since you since you've dug into it probably more than me uh, there's one thing i'm really curious about with the flat earth thing which i was kind of blown away <clears throat> and i this just popped up on my social media which is like uh the the sun not setting or a boat not dipping below the horizon like you could mm-hmm. like the, normally it's like okay the boat the curvature of the earth would make the boat just sort of disappear as it as it traveled but if you zoom in a thousand X with a high powered military camera, the boats right back to level or, or, or the sun, you know, like the sun appears to set and you just zoom in on it and it's in the same place. And it's like, that's, that's really uh, interesting evidence, you know, you, okay. So the counter argument is the earth is just actually way bigger than, than your sort of comprehension. And it would still appear flat. What's, what's your thought? Have you encountered that evidence and, and what's your, yeah, I talked about it. I talked about it on my Waking Infinity show. Um, <clears throat> so first people who's, I mean, this was years ago, actually, started telling me, you know, like 20 miles. If you, if you were to be in Florida and you were to take a camera and you were to look at Key West with a good enough camera, the buildings should be four feet to 10 feet or something like that below the horizon. The math doesn't work out. And I'm like, I'm bad at math. Can you give me another example? <laughs> so they, they started showing me there's this flat table and they put a camera up to the, you know, and they showed like, look, I'm sliding a card across the table. This is completely flat. The, the, you know, so the, the angle of the camera is completely flat um, with the table. And then he took a quarter and he slid the quarter away from the camera and the quarter seemed to dip beneath the horizon and he was and and then he went on to to say like and you know this is like a fourth grade you know thing you could you know like kids in kindergarten could do this and figure it out fuck you round earthers you know and i was uh, so i commented on the whole thing i was like all right several variables that we need to account for i don't know what table that is i don't know how flat it is I also don't know how to prove that you sliding a card across the front of it shows that our perspective is equal across the entire length of the table. I also don't know how a camera and a table and a quarter are one-to-one correlations with a sun moving you know, out of your horizon. We're talking vastly more differences. If the scale, it could work out, okay, I, I'm I'm on because I, I try not to just do what he did. Like you guys are dumb. I try not to do that. That's that's falling into a game that's like it's disempowering even to me to fall into it. Um, <clears throat> so I did show that, you know, like now you're calling people retards because they didn't do this trick. Like that's, you know, like you're falling into the same trap. You want people to believe you. That's not how you talk to them. Um, but then with that, I showed the quarter in that very same video got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then it disappeared. It didn't get smaller and then disappear like this. It got smaller and then disappeared. When you look at the sun dipping below the horizon, it doesn't look like it's getting farther and farther away. It does in every video I've ever seen. And I've seen it happen obviously with my own two eyes, but it looks like it's going down. It looks like it's dipping beneath the horizon. It doesn't get smaller and smaller and smaller before it disappears. Actually, it gets bigger. Most times, the sun and the moon will appear bigger over the horizon. So I'm like, there are variables that are unaccounted for here. And, you know, um, I think there was, there was one last point about that. Um, with the, the ship going over the horizon and being able to zoom deeper in on it and see it, 
The only variable I say is like, yeah, you know, you're right. Maybe the earth is just larger than we thought and your math was wrong. And, you know, because your math is wrong, you think that should be four feet beneath the horizon and ergo earth is flat, right? You roll this quarter across a table and it dips beneath the horizon before it shrinks into infinity, right? Ergo, the earth is flat. I'm like, okay, that's a huge leap. There are huge leaps. There are also things about, um, uh, I forget what it was called, but it was uh, Operation High Jump, I think, where they were trying to send missiles to hit the firmament above or something like that. Okay. Because outer space is not outer space. I think when I started talking about like the Mars missions and stuff like that and what's happening on the, uh, on the moon, people were like, outer space is fake. The only thing out there is your imagination. And I'm like, well, what is it that I look at when I look up? And I see stars and they say it's a glass ceiling or we don't know, or it's, it's liquid out there. And to me, I'm like, some of these ideas are romantic. They're romantic. They really are. I don't know if you've seen behind the curve on Netflix, um, but they, they showed a map of, of what flat earth would look like. And they said, South pole is an ice rim. It's like an ice wall. And beyond that, there are actually countries that none of us know about. They're hidden to us and only the elites know about it. And that's why you can't fly over the South Pole. That's also why no country can claim the South Pole. And I was like, ooh, that's cool. That's romantic. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a romantic idea that there's continents out there we haven't even known about. And, you know, so it's romantic. It's awesome as a fantasy and I'm not saying it's wrong. I don't have enough information to say it's wrong. But to me, I can at least say, I'm sorry, but your, your argument is a little weak. It's weak to me because you have to make huge leaps of faith to believe these things. Like, you know, it's like X, Y, and Z equals this. And I'm like, I don't see how you got from here to there. You know, I, I can see how, okay, if the earth is flat, and there is an ice rim. I can see how you could hide continents outside the ice rim. And I, I, you can make sense of, in that narrative, you can make sense of why no country is allowed to plant a flag in South, you know, the South Pole. I can see that. But that one doesn't make the other true. It just means that, like, okay, it piques my interest. It makes this romantic story a little bit more interesting in my mind. And then I get to the point when it comes to the flat earth thing where it's like, you know what? I would have to spend so much of my valuable time away from my family, away from my work, researching this stuff to come to a conclusion, maybe, hopefully, on whether the earth is flat or not. I would rather spend all that time with my family clueless about whether the earth is flat or round. I would rather be clueless about that, spending the time with my family, because I know that on my deathbed, I will regret not having spent more time with my family, not whether I spent the time to figure out whether the earth is flat or not. Because guess what? I might spend all that time. And then in 10 years, it'll all come out to be an intelligence op and you can take an elevator up into space and see the curvature of it. I don't know. I mean, like maybe not 10 years, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make that leap of faith there. But what I'm saying is, is I think it's a waste of time. And I think it's a red herring. Do you know what that term is? Just a, just a false avenue of, of exploration. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Red herring is just like, look over here, look over here, you know, Oh my God, look at what's happening over here. So you can move the chess piece over here. Like that's what I think flat earth is. It's if I came up with a theory and I put all this math to it and I took a lot of time, I couldn't get a million followers. I, I don't think I could. Maybe, maybe I am that good, but I don't think I could get a million <laughs> followers if I made up a conspiracy theory. So to me, it's either right <laughs> or it's an intelligence agency op that allowed for millions of people to get sucked up into this idea. And to me, again, it's, it's operating from a faulty premise. I'm not so hell-bent on trying to, pr- to prove the curvature of the earth. There are so many other things that are much more urgent in my life that are much more valuable in my life. So that's, that's the, the ice wall that I hit with the flat earth theory is like, it's not doing anything for me. It's aggravating me. And everybody who's in this country club, the flat earth country club, 
they're, they're, most of them, some of them are awesome. Most of them are angry. They're really, really angry. They're not nice to other people. And they're in this kind of like conceited elitist group. That's like, if you believe there's an outer space, you're retarded. You've gone full retard. And to me, I'm like, all right, I'd rather go and play music. I'd rather be the dumb guy that doesn't research anything and go play music than be in your country club. So that to me is how I just kind of break down the argument. If you're not harmonious with other people, I'm not even going to listen to your theory because I think we could be living in a hologram. I think this could be a holographic universe and I think it could be closer to it's not flat. It's not round. It's based upon belief and it's based upon collective belief and it's based upon acuity of our being magicians and creating it, creating it as what it is. And I think space, because I remember there was um, there was this Israeli guy who was in the Israeli Space Force or something like that, mm -hmm. that said, Trump and the U.S. administration and we Israelis have been in communication with extraterrestrials. And they say they are not going to make their um, presence known until, until we understand what space is. Not even what aliens are, not what UFOs are, what space is. And I was like, man, that stuck out to me. And I thought about that. What is space other than the bridge between polar, contradictory, and also very mutual possibilities? Space is pregnant with possibility. That to me screams hologram. And that to me screams that mind and the, the acuity of how you can tailor consciousness can make space something that it wasn't before. So to me, flat earth, that's like you're telling me a concrete example of what it is. That doesn't inspire me. Mm. I prefer to look into the hologram theory that we create what reality is, that ah. it's not flat, it's not round, it's holographic. Flat, flat earth theory is passe because you're still living in a 3D, you're still constraining yourself. With mm -hmm. this, like forcing yourself to be like the solidity of matter and all the mm. totally, yeah, totally. I love it. It's, it's disempowering to expanding consciousness. Yes. Before we get before we uh, talk about time and space, I just uh, I had this gleeful idea that we should we actually should make a new conspiracy theory as like a like the Doge coin. I'm in. The I don't need to hear the rest of it. I'm in. <laughs> Just like the wildest story we could come up with, like bedtime, you know, we could just improv it as a, as a bedtime story and then try to, you know, work some evidence. It could be a fun, it could be a fun I'm in. exercise. I'm in. <laughs> then after we release the film about it, <laughs> then we'll launch this podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, see, we just created this. Actually, somebody did something like that. I don't know if you heard about the COVID-19 5G conspiracy. Okay. Did you hear about that? People were saying that 5G is causing coronavirus. Okay. Yeah. Early, very early days, they were like, it's causing cells to release these uh, sort of protective proteins, which Exocro show up. They look like viral particles or something like that. Yeah. 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 So um, there was a guy who put a mask on. He recorded a video. He was in England. He was pretending that he was a, uh, a 5G technician. Okay. And he was like, Hey, you know, I, I've heard of all the conspiracies about 5G and coronavirus and, and stuff like that. And we're not allowed to open these boxes up. And I'm, I'm supposed to put it up there on that tower and I open it up and look, it says COVID-19. Like, what the what the hell, man? Like, I, I don't I don't know what's going on. Why would they put that inside a, a 5G mast? And and then he came out later with a documentary showing like I put a sticker on and I fooled y'all. And to me, I was just like, OK, cool. But do you? Like, and th this isn't knocking what we're about to do because I'm game for what we're about to do. <laughs> but I was just thinking like, you realize, dude, that as you're trying to punk people and you think it's cool, you think it's going to educate people. I think you just ruined some people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think you actually created more harm than good from that. So we would need to flip it around. We would need to be like the conspiracy is like your message at the Power. end of your first film. Uh <clears throat> like proving that you're a superhero or something superhuman yeah yes totally 
totally. And then, I mean, because I guarantee you, it'll also at some point in history prove to be more right than we even thought it was, you know, because like if we are truly if my if my very half baked theory is correct and we are immature magicians and we are living in something that is more magic than we understand that space and earth are more magical and can create beyond our wildest imagination, then we can't even wrap our head around what we're capable of. So we only are shown what we're capable of when we come up with a concept or some kind of way to uh, utilize or access the, the, let's say, the building blocks of what our higher potential is. So we couldn't know and, and this is to me when, when we come to realize that, like, you know, what is God? What if we are God? And what if we don't realize it because we can't wrap our heads around what it is that we are, but we're magic. We can be anything we want. I love tinkering with these ideas and I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to try and write a science book to prove it because I could care less. And I know what kind of arguments and conversations that would spark. Like, wait a minute, where's your peer reviewed blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, I'm a musician, dude. I don't care. Um, <laughs> you like know the, what I mean? Sounds like I'd Joe rather Rogan. stoke. I'd rather stoke your imagination and inspire you to look deeper than to try and prove you something. You know, like I'm, I'm not into that. I'm a filmmaker, not to prove to your intellect some things. I want to move you in a direction and let you see who you are. So, uh, dude, I'm in. Let's do it. Let's let's show people that we're superheroes and you know, like X Men. It, you know, the X-Men is predictive programming. We're actually turning into mutants and the COVID-19 vaccine is actually here to turn us into superheroes and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know. We can throw in a bunch. Okay. Of well, what's your, what's your first, like, have you had an experience where you're like, oh shit, am I superhuman? Like, have you, have you like accidentally stumbled across a superpower in, in your own day to day? You're like, how did I do that? You know what? Um, I've had mystical experiences, non-drug induced mystical experiences, um, but not a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I think I'm far more pragmatic than most people take me for. Um, a lot of the things that I speak about, I speak about because I, be, I absolutely believe we are more than what we think we are, that humans are more than what we think we are. I absolutely believe that. Therefore, I give myself artistic license to talk about us as superhuman. I give myself that artistic license. But, you know, have, have I levitated before? No. Have I experienced ESP before? Not that I can translate as such. My wife and I are so in sync that we will, without a, a known trigger, we'll both think of something at the same time. And then she'll, she'll open her mouth you know, and I'll finish her sentence. And we'll like, now it's gotten to the point where we're like, I don't know what that is, but we're, we're so connected, baby. You know what I mean? Like we just, we just go off like that before my daughter was born. I'm just going to say it. I was seeing orbs, light flashes and fairies, not fairies with wings and stuff. But uh, you know, if you hear, you know, actual stories of people saying like, I've, seen fairies but i don't see them as these little tinkerbells with wings and cute little faces they're just little orbs and stuff like that but you can tell they're sentient because of the way they are behaving with you and your behavior i started experiencing stuff like that before my daughter was born mm. i knew i was going to have a daughter or i knew i was going to have a child i should say i i ended up um I was trimming pot in Northern California. I smoked the bong rip of Girl Scout cookies and I had a panic attack. So I went outside. I was on this beautiful pasture and I just sat down in the grass and put my hands in the grass and a vulture flew over top of my head and was just going straight, just soaring, splitting the sky in half perfectly, not going left or right. And I was like, okay, if that bird doesn't flap its wings once or go to the left or right and it just disappears. I'm going to quit smoking weed. And it did. And I was like, oh, shit. Stopped my panic attack like that. Now. And then it was like, now ask yourself why, Ben. And so I was about to ask myself, why should I quit smoking pot? And as it 
um, it, it had already gone and everything like that. It just came out of my mouth before I could even answer it. I want to have a child. And I never wanted to have a child before that. And so I just started crying and I knew this was a truth for me. It was a capital T truth for me. I want, I want a child. I want it. And then, so I talked to Barbara afterwards. I was like, I just had this experience and um, do you want a child? And she was like, I want to be in a better financial position first. And I was like, I don't like, I, th- like I-, I would love to be in a better financial position, but I don't feel like waiting for anything. I want a child. And she was like, okay. And I could, I could tell like it was exciting to her and also nerve wracking. Little did we know. Uh, and I started having like all these mystical experiences. She left shortly thereafter. She went to go do ayahuasca. And I told her before going there, I was like, send some love to your belly. Cause I just feel a child coming. And then I started doing tarot and like, you know, this one tarot card said, sit and envision the newness that's coming into your life. And I sit and I close my eyes and I don't have these things happen to me. I don't have these kinds of things. An angel made of light. I could barely see the head because the belly was, was pregnant, sat down in front of me. And it was just light coming from this pregnant belly. And the angel took my hands and placed it on the pregnant belly. And I knew at that moment, I was like, oh my God, we're going to have a child. So I hit up Barb and I told her, I was like, I had this incredible experience. And she was like, whoa, that's awesome. Um, and she knew I was coming to, to Amsterdam in a week. She was like, I have a, a gift for you. I want to give you a gift. And I was like, cool. And she was like, do you, um, well, you know what? I'll just give it to you when you get here. I was like, okay, cool. So I get there. I'm tired as hell, long flight. And I get, she picks me up at the airport. She was like, do you want your gift now? Or do you want some sleep first? I was like, I don't want anything before I get some sleep. And she was like, I'm going to give it to you now. I was like, okay. So we sat <laughs> down, she gave me this little box. I unwrapped it and I look in there and it's got this translucent top. So I could see what it was. I was like, why she give me a vape pen? And I flipped it over and there was a blue plus sign on it. I was like, oh, it's a pregnancy. Oh, and I just looked at her <laughs> and we just hugged. And little did I know as all those mystical experiences I was having, um, she was already pregnant. And she was pregnant when I had that panic attack and realized I want to have a child. Wow. So I had this course correction. And I think a big important factor of that was um, she was looking at my face when I saw that, that pen to see that she was pregnant. She was looking at my face and I could tell she was a little nervous. And my reaction was so relieving for her because she didn't want it to be like, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know, she didn't want that. And I was so excited and that like, it was just exactly what I knew I needed at this turn in my life. So as far as I know, that's a long story as far as like, have, have I realized superhuman powers? Those are the only mystical experiences I've had. As far as superpowers, it all comes from practice. Wim Hof, all the stuff that he can do. It's true. You got to practice though. Daniel Kish, the guy who went blind at age five and then taught himself to echo locate. And now he can see around corners, right? Well, that's true, but it doesn't just happen because you want it. It takes practice and discipline and other people are doing the same thing. So do I believe we have latent or dormant superhuman abilities inside of us? I absolutely believe it. Can I prove it? I think there's evidence, there's anecdotal evidence, and there is some science that gets pushed into the woo-woo categories. I absolutely do believe it, but people aren't swayed by proof as much as they are being moved by something, the right narrative at the right time, when you want to realize something about yourself is more powerful than telling somebody, Hey, you're a superhuman when they're in a, when they're trying to figure out a math problem or something like that, you know, they're not in the right set and setting for it. So that's why I believe that, you know, we, we are an over science. Um, uh, we, we like need science today to prove to us everything But we don't realize that throughout evolution, it was the story that moved us. It was it was the story, the narrative that that we have in our heads. And so I think that the narrative is more powerful than the science. And that's to me how I think we're going to show people that, yeah, I I do think we are superhuman. You know, and all that means is we are more than 
that's we are more than we've allowed ourselves to believe. I don't believe that science, if you were to really look at it, would ever disprove that because we're always outgrowing ourselves. Just look at what we've done with technology, you know, and, and then look at the Wim Hofs and the Daniel Kishes and the, I forget their names, but all the idiot savants that have, you know, like impeccable memory. You can fly this one guy over a city, you know, he got hit in the head by a baseball and then he became um, a math whiz and he has, um, what do you call that? Uh, the, the kind of uh, photographic memory. He mm. went on this huge mural and started drawing every building that he saw as he took a helicopter ride over a city to accurate detail, like the amount of windows on each building, where, how they were situated and faced, you know, where the streets were, where the buses were at the moment as he was you know, flying over them. How is that possible? Oh, well, you got to get hit in the head by a baseball if you want that power. No, son, <laughs> sorry. No, there's just <laughs> dormant abilities that need to be awoken. And all we got to find is the trigger to awaken. And I don't think that trigger is a solid 3D thing that you can put into a pill. I think it has to do with our belief, the right flow that we're in, the right set and setting. And it has to do with collectivism. You know, collectively, we can believe things into existence quicker than we can individually. And I think that psychoneuroimmunology and studying indigenous who go into peyote ceremonies and they have miraculous healings, it helps. It happens more in groups than it does individually and isolated. So there's something there. Yeah. We, um, speaking of, speaking of the groups and, and manifesting things, we did an experiment in my mastermind, my business mastermind, uh, which is like a group manifestation practice. So one person's like, here's a result I want in my business. And <clears throat> uh, we copied off Lynn McTaggart's uh, Power of Eight healing circles, mm -hmm. um, but we just made it for business instead. So like, okay, I want to get on TV or I want to like make six figures this month or whatever it is. And, you know, we get, we, we got really clear on like that moment when you knew you had done it. When it's like, oh shit, this is real. Like I got what I wanted and here's how it feels and here's what it looks like and here's what I'm wearing and all that stuff. And then we would all just sort of go into this <clears throat> meditative state and intend for that reality to manifest. And it worked a hundred percent of the time. Hmm. Perfect. Like fla flawless results. I love it. I love it. It sounds like the 10 project by um, man, Tom Carroll, Thomas Carroll. I think it's Tom, Tom Carroll. Carroll. Tom Carroll, the 10 project, because he's saying that even in the Bible, and I need to get back to this guy actually, um, because he wants to build a group of 10. And he says there is, it's it, like, he can find it in the Bible. He can find it in the Kabbalah. He can find it in other myst, uh, like mystery schools and stuff like that, where a group of 10, there's something specific. No, like no more in the inner circle. It has to be 10, no more, no less. And there's something about that configuration, like it's a math equation. And there is massive um, manifestation ability in the right 10 people. People, and there's some way that they come together as well. It's not just take any 10 people who are into, you know, human potential and stuff like that. There's like some kind of way it has to come together and it would feel right. And then you have a group of 10 and then all of a sudden that is, you know, you keep yourself secret that's a secret society that can move some you know really make some waves and um i would to me i think we need to look deeper into those things and i bet you man i bet you military intelligence actually i know it because i've read some of these things they're already looking into those things I heard of um the monroe institute and how the cia was looking into the monroe, monroe institute in the early 80s um uh, actually, remember, it wasn't the CIA. Stuff? It was the Department of the Army, the Intelligence uh, Army Division. What's that? Is that remote viewing stuff? Remote viewing and also um, uh, more than just that, but it's also brainwave patterns and how you can augment brainwave patterns, how you can get people to believe things, but how when you can get people to believe things, scars will disappear on their face, right? Their eyes will change color. Their hair will change its texture because people believe something 
Now go back to what we were saying before. Now we're trying to homogenize belief around the world, let alone the country. We're trying to homogenize belief. You must believe the same thing. Think of the power of belief. If you can change someone's eye color, their hair texture, you can remove scars from them. You kidding? Me? Maybe that's maybe that's why unconsciously flat earthers want so badly for you to believe them so that they can actually just go and like fly through the hole in the Antarctic and like actually see the like if if you believe me, then I can go actually experience it for real. Maybe that is, I don't know. you know, and like, I think deep down inside, we know our own powers, you know, like, I think we know we're on powers and, th- and they are partial drivers of what we want. I don't think we're just dumb apes that are just trying to gratify ourselves to death. Um, I do think we are in touch with our higher powers and our higher self. Um, and I think that we've, we've lost a certain remembrance of ourselves and, and perhaps, Perhaps the flat earthers really are like, you need to believe me because that's part of the magic of it. And maybe we all realize that belief has something to, I mean, why do all, you know, I, I can't rail against us, you know, trying to homogenize belief too much because if you look at tribes throughout history, they've done the same thing, right? Cultural containers, it, it's safer if you all believe the same thing. It has actually historically been safer if you all believe the same thing. And it just, and it feels better, you know, like I've been in groups where everybody's talking about just different stuff and it's like, you're kind of bored, kind of uh, feeling like you're the odd man out. And then when everybody's talking about the stuff that you're into, you're like, yeah, this is, I can dig it. So totally for sure. Totally. All right. Let's make this film, man. (laughs) Okay. All right. And then make a film about (laughs) it, I should say. (laughs) Oh man. The conspiracy um, that we are superhumans. Conspiracy with this. Oh, this is so good. Um man, this was this was super this is probably a great place to wrap. Uh this is super good. Just riffing with you. I have and, to pee uh, anyway, so my bladder, my my bladder 90 tell, minutes. It could tell the future. <laughs> it knew that you were gonna wrap it right now. <laughs> we're we're on you a, have to believe me by one the way. of those you like have to believe that. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. I've been drinking this whole time too. So uh all right, Ben, where can uh, people find your, your work and pirate it for their own profit? Please go to Ben <laughs> Joseph Stewart, download everything I've done, remove my name and put your own on there, put it up on your own website, benjosephstewart.com. Um, you'll find all my media there. My first three films and one of actually my latest film. Um, so that's Esoteric Agenda, Chimatica, Ungrip, and dmt quest which is the most recent one they're all free on youtube so you can find all of them there um and then i would say follow me on instagram um ben stewart dali or is it ben joseph stewart i can't remember i think it's ben stewart dali d-a-h-l-i so um find me on instagram uh i really i spend more time on instagram than i, I spend no time on twitter uh but more on Instagram than Facebook than anything like that. So um, I would say find me there, go to benjosephstewart.com and, uh, and most of my stuff's up on YouTube. Actually go to my YouTube channel because every Monday I do a news show called Waking Infinity. So my YouTube channel, if you just search for Ben Stewart or the Ben Stewart podcast, you'll find my channel. Um, and so I do Waking Infinity News on Mondays. And then on Wednesdays, I release clips from previous podcasts. Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, I have the Ben Stewart podcast, which I got to get you on there as well. Um, and then on Fridays, I do Friday night acoustic nights. So YouTube is another thing I'm trying to uh, prop up right now. All right. All right. Well, you're you're prolific and uh, it's good stuff. So recommend that to everyone. Uh, thanks for coming on been amazing man thanks yeah see you next time peace